In the second unit of this lecture, we're going to discuss various optimization algorithms. Let's start by reviewing again the standard vanilla gradient descent algorithm. We start by initializing the weights w. Here zero is the time index zero or iteration number zero. And by picking a learning rate, which is a scalar factor. And then for all data points, we do the following. Note that this is a loop over all data points of the data set. In contrast to stochastic gradient descent, where we loop over a mini batch. So for all data points, we forward propagate the input to calculate a prediction. And then we back propagate the gradients starting from the loss node in order to obtain the gradient of the loss function with respect to every parameter of our model w. So this is the gradient per data point. And then we simply update the gradients by moving a little bit into the negative direction of the average gradient over all the data points. If the validation error decreases, we uh, go to step two and repeat, and otherwise we stop. However, in deep learning, we typically deal with millions of parameters. And we also deal with a very large number of training points, which makes this update here very expensive. And also we have to do many updates in deep learning typically. So this becomes very slow or doesn't even fit into GPU memory. Therefore, in practice, what we do is we use stochastic gradient descent where um, we utilize the observation that the total loss over the entire training set can be expressed as um, an expectation. So here we have the uh, total loss over all the data points from before. And this can be expressed as an expectation over drawing all the data points with uniform probability. And then it's an expectation over the loss function. And um, the insight is that this ex expectation can be approximated by a smaller subset of the data. So what we've done here is we've approximated this uh, true gradient with a subset of the data points. And therefore, the uh, gradient can also be approximated. The only difference to the previous equation is now that we have added the NABLA operator, the gradient symbol, which we pushed through the equations. And so the gradient, the true gradient over all the data points is now approximated by a gradient that is computed from a small batch, maybe 64 elements out of 1 million training points. In other words, we get a noisy approximation to the gradient. Here's some remarks on STD. This smaller data set is called a mini batch. And in this lecture, we typically use B, capital B, as the batch size. And we should choose this capital B as large as the GPU memory allows. Yeah, typically B is much smaller than the data set size, 8, 16, 32, 64, for example. However, smaller batch sizes lead to larger variance in the gradients, to more noisy updates. But this effect gets averaged out over time as we do many, many steps. The batches can be chosen randomly or by partitioning the data set, a priori to optimization. So during optimization, we can either draw randomly from the full data set or we first partition the data set. However, we need to be careful that we shuffle the data set when we do the partitioning, because if we take the raw data set and we take the first 10 elements and then the second 10 elements and then the third 10 elements, it's very likely that there is some correlation between the elements because Typically, data sets are recorded sequentially, and so there is a correlation between the elements. So we first shuffle the data set, and then we partition the data set. Ideally, and theoretically, more valid, we, however, 
choose completely randomly at every um, mini batch update. This is a little bit more uh, expensive memory wise. It's much more efficient if we can pre partition the data set and then dynamically load all the batches into memory, GPU memory. Yeah, so, um, and, and I also like to introduce the terminology that we're going to use here throughout this lecture. An iteration is a single gradient update based on a single mini batch. That's what we call an iteration. That's one iteration, one gradient update step of the algorithm. In contrast, an epoch is a complete pass through the training set. It means if we have a mini batch size of B, and we have a data set size of N, um, we have N over B iterations in one epoch. We need to do N over B iterations to see, statistically see every data element once. Okay. So here's the algorithm. Um, we have seen this already. We initialize the weights, pick a learning rate and a mini batch size, which is an additional hyperparameter now. And then we draw random mini batches. And for all mini batch elements now, this is different from before. We forward propagate the inputs and then we back propagate the gradients and then we update the parameter vector by going a small step into the negative direction of the average over the mini batch. If the validation error decreases, we continue, otherwise we stop. Now this allows for training with limited memory, which is typically the case if we apply deep learning on parallel hardware such as GPUs, we're limited to the GPU memory, which is uh, in most cases much smaller than other sorts of memory like standard RAM or disk memory. And this is possible because we split the data into these chunks, into these batches. However, it also introduces stochasticity. The batch gradients approximate the true gradient. Here's an example. And in the following slides, I'm always going to use the same example. What you're going to see here is a control plot. Um, this is a visualization of a quadratic a 2D parabola that slopes upward more quickly in this direction and more slowly in this direction. And we can see also the value of the individual contour or height lines of this function. So we have the minimum zero here in the center. And then as we go outwards, we increase. And so that's what we're going to consider as a very simple loss function, right? We have the loss now defined, not in terms of a complicated network, just as a, a linear or a quadratic function of the input parameters w1 and w2. And this is what the function looks like. You can see that the function slopes upwards less quickly in w1 direction because we have multiplied a factor 0 0.1 here but it slopes upwards more quickly into this W2 direction because we have multiplied a factor of one in front of W2. So this is a very simple uh, loss function that we're optimizing. It has a very simple relationship, a quadratic relationship with respect to the weights, but it serves the purpose of visualizing what different optimizers do very well. Now, the gradient of this function is given like this, just uh, computing the, the derivative of this function with respect to w1. This is the first element of this vector. And the second element of this gradient vector is the derivative with respect to w2. Now to simulate the stochastic process of mini batches, what I've done is in all of the visualizations that I'm gonna show you in the following, I've added a little bit of noise to the gradient. This simulates the gradient of um, stoch uh, stochastic gradient descent where we go over mini batches. So the gradient becomes noisy. Okay, so now let's apply our um, stochastic gradient descent update equations to this problem. 
We start at a particular w0. We're always going to start here at um, minus 1 and 9, minus 1 and minus 9, or minus 9 and minus 1. And then we are running steps of this algorithm. Here's uh, the equation of the updates again. We're always going a little bit into the negative gradient direction. Now what happens if we choose the learning rate too small is that we do not converge. Here we see what happens for 100 steps in the beginning because the slope is still large enough, the gradient is still large enough. Um, we make bigger steps, but then as we reach this um, valley here where the slope is, the gradient is not as high anymore, we make smaller steps because the, the gradient is directly related um, to the uh, length of the step that we do because eta is the learning rate is constant. So we're multiplying it with this gradient. If the gradient becomes small, the steps that we do also become smaller. And here in this particular case, we've chosen eta equals 0 0.1. Now, if we choose the learning rate too high, in this case, we've chosen eta as 1.01, we see that the model heavily oscillates. We're getting closer to the optimum, but we are heavily oscillating around the optimum. In other words, we diverge. So choosing eta, choosing the correct eta is quite brittle. Why is this happening? Well, we have seen an example on the illustrations in the first unit where we are successively overshooting if the learning rate is too high, then we're ending up on the other side of the valley, it's just a slightly bit outside, more outside than we have been on this side. And so we are successively increasing this effect until we reach like very large values. You can also see the noise in the result. Not all of these um, um, points are equally, uh, equally aligned, equally distributed. This is coming from the noise that we have added to the gradient. Okay, so choosing a learning rate that is too high leads to oscillations or divergence. Now here in this case, we've chosen a better learning rate. A good learning rate, in this case 0 0.99, works better. We're coming closer to the optimum, but it's still inefficient. It's very slow because we still have this oscillating effect here and we still don't have convergence. In fact, as we'll see, with a fixed learning rate, we can actually never converge. Yeah. So this is, this is what happens with a learning rate of 0 0.99. We oscillate towards the minimum, we're coming closer and closer, but the step sizes become smaller and smaller. And still, at the, even if we would be converged at the end, if we, if we, even if we would start at the optimal solution, um, we would oscillate around that solution due to the noise in the mini batch gradients. Now, how can we choose the right learning rate? One method to do so is line search. What we would do in line search is that we would compute the mini batch gradient and then find the optimal step size by solving an optimization problem that minimizes this loss function by going um, from the current parameter estimate into the direction of the gradient by the step size that we're optimizing for. And then we can update the weights accordingly using this optimal step size. So for instance here, if we would find the optimal step size, we would end up exactly here in the, at the minimum along this ray here, along this direction here. However, this Line search technique, which is quite common in other applications of optimization, is not practical for, practical for deep learning as we need to solve very large systems at each step. So it becomes very slow and expensive. And furthermore, because we are considering many batches here, it's not necessarily the optimal step size of the total overall loss. As this step size that has been found here is only optimal for the current mini batch. So therefore, this technique is not used in practice.
Let's talk a little bit more about convergence of SGD. As already mentioned before, even when starting at the optimal solution, we will not stay at the optimal solution when applying SGD. And the reason for this is that the gradients are noisy. So we'll always do a step. We'll always step away from the optimum. We'll oscillate around the optimum, but we'll always oscillate. In this example, we have initialized at zero, but we're oscillating around zero. So even when starting at the optimal location, um, we will we will not uh, um, stay at the optimal location, which means we'll, with, a, with a fixed learning rate, eta, stochastic gradient descent can actually not converge. What does convergence actually mean? Well, if we formalize it mathematically, convergence of a series is defined as follows. So series is the sum of terms of an infinite sequence of numbers, a1, a2, etc. So here we have this infinite sequence of numbers where we let n go to infinity. This is called a series. When does a series converge? A series is called convergent if there exists a number s star such that for every arbitrarily small positive number epsilon there exists an integer n such that for all little n bigger than this number n, this condition holds. In other words, no matter how we choose this epsilon, how small we choose this epsilon here, we know that we can find an n such that, um, we, can, that we can find a big n such that all sn for which n is, is bigger than this big n is uh, as close to s star or closer than epsilon. It's actually closer to s star than epsilon. Right? That means convergence. So we can, we can, by going long enough, we can come to the optimal solution arbitrarily close, in other words. And SGD updates can be interpreted in the same way. So here's the SGD update. And we're now going to interpret this as a parameter series. So we start with W0. And then we go a step into the gradient direction. And L0 here is just an abbreviation of um, the mini batch loss gradient at W0. Now, to get the parameters at iteration 2, we have the same equation, just increment by 1, such that we can now recursively um, insert the equation above into this equation here. So if we insert this equation into this equation, we get this equation. So it's just basically inserting this here. Now we have an equation for W2. And we can insert W2 into the equation for W3, and so on. So this is the sequence that we obtain. And here we have A1, A2, and A3, which are the elements of this series. Now we can define convergence of SGD as follows. The SGD optimizer convergence converges if there exists a vector W star such that for every arbitrarily small positive number epsilon, there exists an integer t such that for all time steps bigger than this integer t, we come arbitrarily close to w star. It's the same argument. No matter how small we choose epsilon, we'll always find an iteration number t, a time step t, such that from there on, we will always be at least as close to w star. As epsilon. And now there is a famous uh, theorem from Robbins and Monroe that says the following. Let eta1, eta2, and so on be a sequence of positive step sizes with the uh, properties that the infinite sum over eta 
is infinity and the infinite sum of eta square is smaller than infinity so it's finite and let fervor um, gt denote an unbiased estimate of the gradient of the loss function at the parameter at time t so it's basically our gradient during stochastic gradient descent in other words the expectation of gt is the gradient the true gradient then the series this update series here which is uh, as you recognize the update of sgd for t towards infinity converges to a local minimum of the loss function of w we can't guarantee that it converges to a global minimum because we have a non-convex loss function in the case of a non of a convex loss function we would guarantee that it even converges to the global optimum but we can guarantee that it converges and an example for such a sequence of step sizes is this one here where we have eta t equals uh, some hyperparameter learning rate over t so if we decay the step size if we decay the learning rate rapidly with one over t we can guarantee convergence okay so under certain properties sgd is actually able to converge that is what we know now um, however there's some problems with sgd as well first the gradients are scaled equally across all dimensions and that's not ideal as we have seen before because we have to choose very conservative learning rates to avoid divergence however in this case in the case of choosing the learning rates very small the updates become very small as well so we have very slow progress and finding a good learning rate is very difficult so let's look next at a an improvement over vanilla sgd which is sgd with momentum so here's the motivation for sgd with momentum this is again an example of vanilla sgd with a good learning rate as we've seen before it's exactly the same example from before where you can see this oscillating effect what we see is that this sgd here oscillates along w2 so what we ideally want to do we want to dampen it in this direction for instance by averaging over time if we would average these oscillations over time we would oscillate less furthermore sgd makes very slow progress along the w1 axis so we like to accelerate along this direction to more quickly arrive at the minimum and so this is exactly the idea of momentum what we want to do is we want to update the weights but we don't want to update the weights just by looking into by going a little uh, negative step size into the gradient direction but we want to update it with an exponentially moving average of the past gradients so that we can introduce this effect of momentum this dampening here's what this looks like if you compare this to the previous slide you see the oscillations have been dampened and we also come a little bit closer to the optimum and here on the bottom you see the update equations for sgd with momentum what we have here is the update equation for the weights that now depends on another variable that is updated over time which is the velocity the velocity is basically the negative um, gradient plus a factor times the previous the velocity at the previous iteration and this is why it's called momentum we keep a little bit of the information of the of the motion at the previous iteration this means that if we oscillate heavily then these effects will cancel out because with in this case beta 
we will um, combine a negative value with a positive value, which is at the um, which is the value at the uh, at the new um, location. Right, and this is why we have this dampening effect. If we choose beta one equals zero, we get exactly stochastic gradient descent. Right. This velocity will always be exactly equal to minus the learning rate times the gradient. So beta must be somewhere between zero and one. In the practice, um, often 0 0.9 is chosen as a, as a good compromise between, you know, taking into consideration previous velocities and um, the new uh, gradient direction. Now, this is how momentum is traditionally introduced, but I like to rewrite, rewrite it a little bit. As this expression here couples momentum with the learning rate. Now, in this case, we can change the learning rate without also changing the momentum due to this coupling here. But we can find a better parametrization as follows. So if we write the uh, velocity as a linear combination of the previous velocity and the gradient, now in this case it's a positive gradient, and then we update the weights based on the negative step size times the velocity, then we have effectively decoupled beta and eta. So we can now independently change the two and inspect their behavior. So it's much more convenient. Again, we have the same behavior that if we choose beta one equals uh, zero, then uh, uh, we will uh, be left with uh, standard stochastic gradient descent. So um, what this effectively, both of these equations effectively implement is um, they are calculating an exponential moving average of the gradient here with m. To see this a little bit better, um, let's have a closer look. And let's also see why this is an exponential moving average. We now again abbreviate the gradient at duration t with gt. And so here we have the update equation of the velocity that we've seen on the previous slide. And let's assume we start with velocity zero. Now in the first step, we simply have this equation because we have the initial velocity is set to zero. The first term goes away and so we're left with the second term. Now the velocity at the second iteration depends on the velocity at the first iteration. So we can now plug in this expression here, we get this expression, and so on. So this continues. If we continue this, we see that the weight decays exponentially. We have always one minus beta one, so we can factor that out. And then we have a beta one to some power that is decreasing and g with an index that's increasing. That's what this expression tells us. We can see now that the weight that's multiplied to the gradient at a previous time or iteration i is decaying exponentially because we have a minus i here in um, the exponent of beta. So let's say the current time step is 10 and we are looking into the contribution of the gradient at time step 1, then we have beta to the power of um, 10 minus 1 minus 1, which is um, beta to the power of 8. So, and because beta is smaller than 1, it decays in this exponential manner. So the contribution of a gradient that's further away in the past is much smaller than the contribution of a gradient that's closer. But the contribution is always there contribution never completely goes away. It just becomes invisibly small. So here's an example of this exponential moving average behavior. In this case, um, there's a step function, a function with two steps, g, 
and I've plotted the exponential moving average for beta 0.8 and beta 0.95 and you can see how this m tracks g and depending on how we choose this uh, momentum term here we track it ever more quickly or we track it more slowly sometimes not even reaching the value of g but starting to um, track another value without having actually reached or come very close to g here's another example um, where we have a highly oscillating uh, sine function plotted g t and we can see that the um, exponential moving average depending on how we choose this momentum parameter dampens this behavior here in blue okay so this is good this is something that people often use it makes sgd more efficient and it allows for choosing um, also choosing a little bit larger learning rates now there is something even better that we can do and that's called Nesterov momentum. Nesterov momentum is similar to momentum. The only difference is that the gradient of the mini batch that's computed. So here, this calligraphic B means it's the gradient of the loss over the mini batch. So the gradient of the mini batch is not evaluated at the previous W, so WT, this element, this, this entry here was WT before, but now it's evaluated at the predicted parameters. What we effectively do is we are using the fact that we have already an estimate of where we might end up. So we can predict into the future. We can predict WT plus one by taking the previous WT and adding the um, velocity of the uh, that has been previously estimated to go one step further into the same direction right? so this is the prediction of the parameters and the prediction has been computed without evaluating the loss function it's just a prediction based on the velocity we're going one step further with the current estimate of the velocity and so we use this prediction now to evaluate the loss function at this prediction and this makes the algorithm more efficient for non-stochastic problems, for non-mini-batch problems, even provably more efficient. And that's why it's particularly useful for classical problems, but it's also sometimes applied in the context of deep learning. Again, um, this expression here can be transformed into a expression where the hyperparameters beta and eta are decoupled as before. And this is what it looks like. Now you can see that the behavior of the function has been dampened even more. So we have a, a higher uh, or faster dampening by using the same uh, learning rate and the same momentum. It's kind of an antis anticipatory update, um, which looks into the future and therefore increases the re responsiveness of the optimizer without um, any significant additional overhead except for actually um, calculating this vector addition here. And this has significantly increased the performance of particularly recurrent neural networks on a variety of tasks. This is a better way of incorporating mo momentum into the model. And the RNNs are difficult to train because they are very long sequences where gradients can vanish or explode quickly. The next algorithm we're going to talk about is RMSProp. RMSProp has been introduced by um, Jeff Hinton in the context of his lecture. There's actually no paper about RMSProp. Everybody refers to this lecture from Jeff Hinton. The motivation for RMSProp is similar to the motivation of momentum, but it it's implementing use implemented using a different strategy 
the observation here is not momentum. It's not like we need to dampen um, the behavior, but the observation is that the gradient distribution is very uneven and thus requires conservative learning rates. We've already seen this before for SGD. We have a very strong gradient in this direction where we actually want to have a smaller gradient. We have a small gradient in this direction where we actually want to have a larger gradient. Right? In this example, the gradients are very large in W2, but they are small in W1. Now, the idea of um, S-prop is to divide the learning rate um, by a moving average of the squared uh, gradients. Right. So we're not keeping a velocity of the gradients, but now we're dividing the learning rate individually per per meter, W1 or W2, by the moving average of the squared gradients um, which is a measure of the variance in the gradients for that particular parameter over time or over the course of the iterations. So here's an example and you can see also how, how much more quickly this converges for this particular quadratic. Um, here's the mathematical form of the update. Now instead of m the velocity here we have v, um, so m I used m to denote the velocity because m is the first momentum. Now v is the second momentum because here we are updating this v as a linear combination of the previous v and the square of the gradients of the mini batch. And this symbol here is the uh, element-wise product between these gradient vectors. So per element, you can think about this equation completely uh, independent per element. Per element, we are updating or we are estimating the variance, the running variance of the gradients for that dimension. And then in the update, we simply divide the learning rate by the square root of that estimated variance plus some epsilon in order to avoid numerical problems. And again here, these are element-wise operations. So we have an element-wise division and element-wise square root. Right. So V is an estimate of the uncentered variance. It's uncentered because we are not, we're just considering the square here. We're not considering the mean. And um, typical values for beta 2 are 0 0.99 and typical value for epsilon is 10 to the power of minus 8 to avoid these numerical instabilities. You can see that this algorithm converges quite quickly actually to locations around the optimum. We can also see that it jumps around particularly in the beginning and we're talking about why this happens in a second. Some remarks. Um, the division by the running average of squared gradients adjusts the per weight step size. This is how you can think about it. You adjust the per weight step size. So here in this regime here for instance we're um, moving much more into the W1 direction than into the W2 direction, despite the gradient in W2 direction is much larger. And this allows for increasing the learning rate compared to vanilla SGD. However, um, one problem is that in the first iterations, the moving average is actually biased towards zero. And this is what causes this jumping behavior. Because this is a very bad estimate in the beginning, um, we're dividing through a very small number because we have initialized v to some value, which is uh, something that's close to zero. So we divide by something that's close to zero. And so we are actually accelerating before uh, converging. And this is something that is going to be addressed in the following slides, um, particular by Adam. Adam is the most used and default optimizer that's that's used today due to its robustness and because it combines all of the uh, previously mentioned ideas and it also incorporates this um, debiasing operation that removes this initial bias towards zero so here's the trajectory that is followed by the atom optimizer and below you can see the update equations for the Adam optimizer. You can see that Adam keeps a running average of the first moment and the second raw moment, the uncentered variance 
where the first moment uh, corresponds to the equation of the momentum, SGD with momentum algorithm that we've seen before, and the second equation corresponds to the RMS prop algorithm. And the update then simply combines these two by going a little negative step into the direction of the velocity of the um, gradients divided per element again by the element wise running average of the uncentered variance plus this epsilon here. So it's simply combining these two ideas. Now, coming back to this problem of bias towards initial value of zero. This is not the full Adam update equation. This is a simplified version that I've shown you so far, just to illustrate that it connects to momentum or combines momentum with RMS prop. Now the question is also for Adam, as for RMS prop, what happens at t equals one? Well, again, at t equals one, we have the mean and the variance initialized to zero. So both M1 and V1 are strongly biased towards this initial value because we are multiplying with like large values here. We're multiplying um, zero in into this equation and only um, with uh, smaller values, we are integrating the current um, estimates of the square of the gradient and of the gradient here in the first equation. So for t equals one um, or for t equals zero, so for m1 and v1, both of these are heavily biased towards zero. And we see this behavior that we've shown before because we need to divide like something very small through something very small. And we should correct this bias at the beginning of training. It's only affecting the beginning of training. And what Adam does is simply adding another update here that's dividing the estimated first moment by one minus beta to the power of t plus one and also the estimate, the running exponential moving average estimate of the second moment by one minus beta two to the power of t plus one and then plugging this in. It's basically just rescaling. Now, the question of course is why is this particular modification actually removing the bias from the Adam update equations? Let's have a closer look at this. Again, as before, let g t denote the gradient of the stochastic objective. And that further um, m0, we're doing the derivation here for m, but it goes through exactly the same way for v. So let m0 be initialized to zero, the zero vector. <clears throat> then the update here, m t plus one as the linear combination can be written as this expression here. This is easy to see. We've seen something similar on previous slides. Um, I can recommend that you do this um, quickly on pen and paper. Um, it's easy to see that this basically leads to this expression here. Right, so we have this exponential decay due to this exponential moving average. Um, okay, so now the question is, what is the expectation of this moving average with respect to the expectation of the gradient? So let's calculate the expectation of this moving average. This is the expectation of this expression, which I've written here. Now, um, because the expectation is a linear operator, we can push this through. And assuming that the expectation of GT is similar to the expectation of G at previous time steps, we can approximate this expression by um, saying, well, the expectation of GI is the same as the expectation of GT and, and pulling this in front. And then similarly, we can also um, say that the, uh, or we can, we, can, we can easily see that this expression here is equal to this expression because here we are counting downwards, here we're counting upwards. So this is the same. Now, this is a standard mathematical series, um, which has a simple solution, which is 
1 minus beta to the power of t over 1 minus beta, or beta 1 more precisely. So 1 minus beta cancels and we're left with 1 minus beta 1 to the power of t times the expectation of g t. And I highlighted it here because now we can already see that the ratio of the expectation of this running average over the expectation of the gradient is exactly this factor, which is exactly this factor here that has been factorized in or divided by uh, in this uh, original equation in order to remove the bias. Right? And exactly the same holds true for V as well. Okay. It's also possible to combine Adam with Nesterov's momentum. However, this variant is, is less well known and less used in practice. There is a paper I like to refer you to by Dozat um, incorporating nest of momentum into Adam. Um, it's a workshop paper. It shows that in some cases you can get improved performance um, and many frameworks have implemented this algorithm, this optimization algorithm, but it seems for that for really big problems, it doesn't uh, bring a major benefit over Adam, so many people are not using it. And finally, um, let me show you some illustrations of optimizer uh, of the optimizer operating over time. So here are three different cases on this on the left. Let's start with this one here. Um, we have one case where we have this uh, multiple local minima. We have different optimizers, Ada Delta, Ada Grad, Adam, Gradient Descent, Momentum, RMS Prop. And you can see that they converge into different local minima and they converge at different speeds and they also oscillate with different frequencies. So depending on the problem that you have, you might want to choose a different optimizer. Here's another example with three local minima that are quite steep and you can see what happens to some of these optimizers if they are steep? Gradient descent oscillates a lot. And here we have a case where we have a very uh, flat plateau region that only some of the optimizers are actually able to escape from. We have looked at some optimizers, but state of the art deep learning frameworks optimize many, uh, implement many. Uh, different optimizers. Here is uh, some examples, but there is many more. We have seen SGD, Momentum, RMS Prop, Adam, but there is also Adagrad, Ada Delta, Adamax, IMS Grad, etc. In practice, Adam is the most uh, is mostly the method of choice due to its robustness and universality. So this is the default choice that you might want to try if you have, um, you know, if you started working on a problem. And it works quite well in practice. And I recommend to have a look at these websites here, which provide more visualizations of optimizers. I also want to remark that in classical optimization, what people typically do is using uh, second order methods that also compute the Hessian, second order derivative, or an approximation to the Hessian, such as um, you know, Newton, Gauss Newton. LBFGS, Liebenberg, Marquardt, etc. However, these methods are not applicable to many batches as we have the situation in deep learning as the Hessian estimates are too inaccurate. And they are often also not tractable um, because they require the inversion of a very, very large matrix in the order of um, the number of parameters times the number of parameters. Therefore, second order methods are typically not applied for training deep models. 